We are planning an expedition to Ecuador and Galapagos, which we head off for in June 2018. We are busy preparing and fundraising for our big adventure. We've held bake sales and done lots of backpacking. We've designed, printed and even sold special edition school calendars that you can purchase in some of the local shops or even Sainsbury's. All of our fundraising events have been branded under a school motto, Spero Mayora, meaning I hope for better things. Um, okay, so uh, how, how are you going around fundraising? Uh, we've been doing all the backpacking at like um, Sainsbury's and where was that all we done? Was it? Yeah, it was both Sainsbury's. So oh, we've both Sainsbury's. Sainsbury's backpacking mm -hmm. uh, to raise money. We also did a quiz night we ran for teachers and parents and things, and that was yeah. I think that was quite successful as yeah, well. I think, that's really I think that was so enjoyed by a lot of people who came as well. And you got these lectures. These, uh, these yeah, we've got. Well. Yeah. And we've got uh, a full house tonight. We've got a lot of people coming. <laughs> Is there anything you wanted to ask about? Sort of planning for a big expedition like this. Uh, oh, you can. Well, I mean, do you have any tips for fundraising for us to help start build on our, um, our own fundraising? Yeah, I mean, I often find, you know, with any big adventures or journeys, the hardest part is getting to the start line. You know, it's mm -hmm. actually getting the means to, to do what you want to do. Um, mm -hmm. And people tend to waste a lot of time cold calling, just trying to get in touch with people and businesses that they think might want to help. But, yeah. you know, if I think back over my career, all the support and the sponsors I've had is through a direct network, so actually talking to people, okay. not not emailing them, not cold calling them, but just talking to people. And rather than asking people for direct sponsorship, I always ask people for who they know, because people don't like giving you money, but people are very proud of who they know. People okay. are proud. People are proud of their network and their their reach. So 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 the tactic I use is, you know, I ask my friends, I ask my family, I ask, you know, the, the business contacts. I say, well, this is what I'm doing. And you know, I get them really excited about what it is, mm -hmm. and then I say, "Well, you know, and this is what I need to make it happen. Yeah. Uh, who do you know? Who can you introduce me to that you you think would like to hear about this?" Mm -hmm. And that's a clever way of doing it because then they know that they can come back and support you themselves, and you can keep the conversation going. But also, it it, it extends the sort of the web of contacts. If I was to tell you that my big title sponsors over the years, and these guys are, you know, giving a hundred thousand plus, have all been through a second or third or fourth point of contact. If you say to somebody, "Will you sponsor me?" That's a yes or no question. Mm -hmm. And if they say no, that's the end of the conversation. Whereas if you say to them, "This is what I'm doing. Isn't it amazing? Mm -hmm. This is the support I need. Now, who can you? Who, who do you think would be interested? Who do you think could help?" And then they make a couple of introductions, even if they don't personally help you they've caught, they kept the conversation going. Okay. So direct network, ask everyone you know who they know, ask to sort of widen the web. You're at the center of the web, widen the web, keep, keep the momentum going. Don't ask yes, no questions about sponsorship. Mm -hmm. You know, get people excited about what you're doing and then get people to, 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 to help out with who they know. It's amazing, people are always like, oh, you should talk to them or talk to them. Mm -hmm. That's the way to keep doing it. And when you get them that excited, they might come back themselves and give you some, some sponsorship as well. We'll probably need quite a lot of motivation on our trips since we're away from home and stuff. Like, mm. what motivates you to succeed? Um, I just love what I do, and I think you, you know if you guys have you worked so hard to, to do this and get there, I think you know that'll be a really good motivation for you guys. All the fundraising and everything you've done, that'll be good. You know, for me, I just you know when I'm away quite a long time and away from family and friends, it can be you know you can get quite homesick, but. I just think it's just for the short amount of time. You know, my career is not going to be that long. So, you know, when in a couple of years' time when I'm retired, I'll be able to spend as much time with my family as I want. And it's just for the short amount of time that I'm going to go and do something that I really, really want to do. So it's just kind of putting it in perspective and then um, and thinking that you've worked all this, you know, you've done all this hard work to get there. It's not going to be that long. And then you'll be able to kind of share all the memories when you get back. So so when, when are you heading off? What's the plan? Uh, just early June, isn't it? So uh, mid June? Yeah, it's mid June. So the plan, the plan between now and then is to fundraise, fundraise. busy fundraising. Yeah. I guess planning the trip in terms of what you pack and yeah. some logistics. Yeah. Yeah. Have you done anything like this before? No, no. <laughs> not on the scale. Um, since we're going away for two weeks, it's quite a long time without seeing family or anything. Um, how do you cope being away from home? I mean. I'm lucky enough that when I've kind of gone away, I've got access to my phone and to Skype and the, the technology nowadays is so much easier than it used to be that I can kind of phone and things like that. Um, it's just about kind of taking things with you that will, you know, be nice to have there to kind of remind us, maybe like a photograph or 
you know, a little kind of keepsake that you can kind of have to remind you of people back home and it's a nice little reminder that you've got, you know, I don't know how much access you guys are going to have to any kind of technology, so, you know, I think Skype and FaceTime will be out, especially that week in the jungle, but, you know, if you take a photograph or something like that, it's quite nice to have just as a, you know, just a little kind of piece of home yeah. you can take with you. Yeah. Do you have any tips for us then? This is obviously our first ex expedition, it sounds like anything we've done before, so. Well, I would suggest pack carefully by that I mean lay out everything you think you might need mm -hmm. and then be absolutely ruthless and get rid of probably half of it okay. um, most people who haven't been on expeditions before massively overpack you know so you, once you're out there having too much kit just weighs you down it's a nuisance trust me it's been, I've done stuff in the jungles and humid climates and you know in tough terrain when you're having to lug all the gear with you it's a pain so you need less than you think you need. You know, you don't need, believe it or not, you don't need a fresh pair of clothes every single day. Mm -hmm. um, my record is going 2,000 miles on a bike without a shower. You, you can do these things. Yeah. Um, you might not smell particularly good, but my point is you will be happier if you take the bare essentials. Uh, think through what you need, you know, certainly think, you think anti-malarials and uh, mozzie nets and, you know, the specifics for surviving in a jungle in a remote place and but don't take all the home comforts don't take all the things that you think you need on a day-to-day -day basis living in the wilds of West End Glasgow you don't need them when you're on an expedition take less it'll make you happier um, do you have any tips for coping under pressure um, again, I always think about what I can control so a lot of the times you know when, when I was a bit younger I used to go to race and think oh god, that person's in this race, so the weather's awful, it's going to be a nightmare. Um, and then I just kind of put it back on me. And again, kind of what I said earlier, like I know that I've put in all the hard work, I know I've trained hard, so all that kind of puts it back into my control and I know that I can just go out there and do my best and, you know, and, and that's all I could do. Yeah. Uh, what were, like, the problems you faced when you were in reserve and it was, like, did you want to stop or quit? Um, I mean, there's always sort of, like, the basic logistics of getting clean water. Um, you know, if you can't buy bottled water, making sure you can use chlorine tabs or there's other ways to purify water. You know, so again, clean water is always key. You know, if you can't, you know, the, the, mom the moment you're debilitated through, you know, through illness, which is normally through eating and drinking, then you're, you're no good to anyone. So, uh, you know, really being good at your, your, your uh, admin, you know, looking after your kit, obvious stuff, you know turning your, your boots over, your shoes over, so when you wake them up, you don't put your foot in there and there's a spider or a scorpion. Um, you know, make sure you look out for each other. You know, if somebody's going really quiet for a long period, you know, make sure you find out what's going on. You know, are they worried, are they unwell? It's, you'll, be, you'll see each other completely out of your comfort zone on a, on a journey like this, on an expedition like this. So, sort of having a good buddy system, you know, making sure that, um, you know, you, you've got a really good admin to make sure that your food is, you know, cooked through, your water's clean, you know, you're, you're careful with the bugs and all that sort of stuff. So that's, that's all the basics which you really need to think about the first time you go on an expedition like this. So again, yeah, we're going to have to get our fitness up. <laughs> <laughs> so we're just wondering what's like an easy, not easy way, but like a good way to get up. Well, I think, well, I mean, what is it you're going to be doing? You're going to be doing a lot of walking. Yeah, it's like going climbing. to be sort of longer stuff, the sort of cardio yeah, stuff. Yeah, like, in general, just like long days. Yeah, so just it's probably a lot of kind of doing doing sort of cardio stuff. So all maybe walking, you know, jogging, getting your sort of like your general kind of fitness up mm. there. Are you going to be carrying things? Are you going to be having to yeah, lift yeah, things? Like, yeah. yeah, so then maybe just, you know, a little bit of, um, a little bit of kind of, resistance training, things like that, you know, you can do some sort of conditioning work, so sort of like circuits and things like that, you don't need to do any real gym work in that, but you could do like sort of like, you know, just body circuits, like press up, sit ups, all that sort of stuff, to get your general conditioning up there, and then, you know, that'll help you with the sort of the lifting of things, and then the cardio stuff will help with the long days. So obviously we're going to the jungle as like a team, mm -hmm. and um, like what's an important part of being a member of a team, obviously you're a member of a team? Yeah, I mean, I think it's just, kind of understanding each other and understanding that not everybody's going to be the same. So it was about probably being a bit more patient with each other, being a bit more understanding, just trying to be supportive. I think that's the big thing. I think, you know, everybody kind of, you know, you're going to be obviously together a lot. So you're going to see each other a lot more often than you would normally do. And it's just about being 
yeah, a bit more chilled out, a bit more understanding yeah. and mm. not let little things get to you and then you should all just make sure you're all kind of supporting each other. I think that's the mm. real important mm. thing. Yeah. Um, I guess a slightly different question. How many packs of underwear, how many, <laughs> how much underwear do you pack? Well, when, you, when, you, when you're cycling, uh, so when you're cycling, when you're wearing lycra, you don't actually wear underwear. Oh, okay. So, the, op- the, 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 so for example, cycling around the world, length of the Americas, length of Africa, I would typically have three sets of cycle shorts, okay. like bib shorts, but then for off the bike, I would just have like one pair of one pair of one pair of pants, like something I could wear in the evening. So um, yeah, it's not luxury, but okay. uh, <laughs> you, you don't you don't need much. Do you ever have any self doubt, and if so, how do you? Like out of this state of mind. Yeah, I mean, all the time. I think it's just kind of almost like a human instinct. You always mm. kind of worry and you kind of doubt things. Um, but it's just kind of it's putting it into kind of logic. So for me, if I'm ever at the start of a race and I'm thinking, right, I don't, I'm nervous. I'm worried I'm not going to run well here. I just kind of look back at what I've done and I know that I've trained really hard. I know I've put all the hard work in. I've planned. I've prepared. So when I think about that, then I'm like, well, I should run well. I should run the way I want to run. So it's just about kind of putting that kind of logic spin on it and I can control everything that I've done so I know that I've done everything in my power to be in the best position possible to run well that I shouldn't let the nerves kind of take over that. Yeah. Which is important everyone does sort of experience, not maybe quite on the scale but some experience this when they go out of their comfort zone. Yeah. Experience something new. Yeah I mean going out of your comfort zone can take many different shapes and forms but it has to be a good thing for your own values, for your own motivation with your career with your family with everything back home to have a different perspective you know to take yourself so you see different cultures different places what typically people do is they go on holiday to somewhere you know ultimately quite safe and familiar because it's a tourist destination or they go to a work conference and then they come home and they talk about how different they were um, the more you travel the more you realize the similarities between cultures and people and places especially when you walk between or cycle between places as opposed to just flying in and flying out. So it's really, really helpful to get away from the tourist hotspots, to understand real life, to get a bit of context on your own reality, you know, to realise how insignificant we are on the grand scale of, you know, the billions of people on planet Earth. But the fact that, you know, we do have a footprint, we do create impact, you know, you can see firsthand, you know, the challenges that are facing the world that we live in. You know, when you travel through some of the places you're going, you'll see firsthand what's happening with climate change, you know, with how um, sustainable, you know, production is around, you know, wood and minerals yeah. and, and, and all these topics, which is quite hard to get your head around when you're living in a very safe, secure um, part of the world like, you know, Western Europe. So we get quite blasé about these, thing, these things when we see them in the news, but, but understanding them firsthand and understanding the interaction between us as individuals and the world we live in can only be done through travel, so it's massively important.